one of the biggest priorities in tackling the restoration of dry land will be to include women in processes that have been traditionally taken on by men. Data, data, data. Maintaining and improving soil quality uh, is, is, is quite a challenge, but it can be done. And so it's largely through soil and water conservation structures and uh, use of manure and improved forages that feed the livestock that, that provide that manure. In grasslands, there is generally more carbon below ground than above ground. And so this is a result of the fact that grasses are, are adapted to especially grazing. And so they tend to have relatively small fraction of their biomass above ground, which is of course what provides forage for, for livestock and other animals. Uh, but most of the, the biomass that's actually produced in a grassland is, is produced in the roots. And so of course that's below the soil. Rangelands do store a lot of carbon and especially uh, in, in any grassland that has not been plowed and cultivated for agriculture, there is generally a, a ton of, of carbon, literally tons of carbon in the soil. And that, that carbon comes from the, the root growth, of, especially of grasses, but also other vegetation. And that, that carbon accumulates over millennia of, of grazing with fertilization from livestock. And it builds up and it builds up. The main goal in a rangeland or a grassland is to keep the carbon in the ground. In rangelands, your number one priority is to maintain the quality of soils that are already there. Uh, if those areas are converted to, to crops, then you, that, that is your number one source of degradation in rangelands in terms of soil quality. And so a lot of that carbon will be released to the atmosphere. Uh, you, you, those, those areas will now be more prone to erosion, which not only can release uh, soil carbon, but also the loss of topsoil and nutrients to downslope areas. Uh, in rangelands, that's, it's really about managing what's there. Uh, the soil quality changes slowly. Because that change is slow, you need communities to manage those rangelands in a way where they are benefiting and they and be, mostly through livestock production and therefore through that incentive those those communities and those users and residents of the rangeland provide environmental services like carbon storage keeping that carbon in the ground preventing erosion and maintaining a productive ecosystem which benefits people as well as wildlife and also provides ecosystem services to people who live downstream. <laughs> No uni na alke ekito ngu moi be meto kana nchana imen. In dryland settings where there's more of a patriarchal culture and sets of social norms that determine what women and men can or should or shouldn't do, it's obvious that women still rely upon land resources for a lot of the activities that they're responsible for carrying out. For example, women might use land for water for harvesting firewood for even grazing their own cattle. So their access to land is important and needs to be protected and supported. Women's engagement and especially leadership, assuming leadership positions in conservancy committees has been really important, not only in getting women into conservancy is where some of their gender specific needs are met, but it's also very important for 
supporting women's leadership in communities. It's a transformative kind of process to get women into positions where they are making decisions about how to manage particular lands. And it's also important to have a more socially inclusive approach towards natural resource management. So marginalizing anyone from access can have some dangerous implications for sustainable development and for more equitable access to resources, which in certain communities is very much limited. Some of the drylands areas are already very marginalized. So further marginalizing an individual's access to that land because of their gender, their age, their ethnicity is, is really harmful for particular groups in society. So it will be a big priority to to kind of address some of these social inequalities and engage women in processes of managing land to support more socially inclusive land management, and especially in the restoration. I'm Nixon Parmisa, and the uh, assistant chief of uh, this particular area. So a few years ago, the local community together with the International Livestock Research Institute came up with a, um, uh, an idea to do a mapping outside the Kitengela dispersal area to establish the area that has been uh, taken by fences. Uh, this is in line with conservation and livestock keeping. We decided to come up with a land use plan for Kitengela. Uh, and the idea was to zone all the, 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 the town areas, uh, try to stop the mushrooming of a, a small town within the dispersal area, and be able to create a space for livestock and, and wildlife. So for now, uh, the results of that mapping that was done and uh, adopted by the county uh, uh, government now has really helped us to come up with a conservancy outside the Nairobi National Park. I, I think there hasn't been so much data collected on rangelands and drylands because these, these areas have always seen to be uh, marginal lands by sight. When, when we look at rangelands, Visually, we don't see so much there in front of us than if we look at a forest or if we look at croplands, for example. A lot of the bounty of rangelands, a lot of the, the productivity, the biodiversity is hidden. And as a result, they've received less attention than other ecosystems. We, we started thinking about these data gaps uh, when we were trying to uh, put together articles on rangelands. And uh, we wanted to have some clear facts and figures to use. But when we started looking at the figures that people were using on rangelands, and for example, the spatial distribution of rangelands around the world, uh, some people were quoting 20%, others were quoting 80%, and somewhere in the middle, was 40 to 50%. And we started digging a bit deeper and going backwards to look for the, the actual sources of, of the data that was being used often. And uh, what we found was that really the, the, the primary source of, of many of these figures that had been tweaked and represented in different ways and often badly represented were studies done by FEO in the 1960s. And, and that was really the last time that there was any comprehensive consolidation of data on rangelands. We felt it was really important to start filling some of these data gaps because we, we can't lobby for protection of rangelands unless we show their value. We can't talk about investments in rangelands if we don't know where those best investments are most appropriate. We can't talk about restoring rangelands unless we know where are the places that we need to start, where the opportunities are for restoration. And for all of this, we need data. This was the main drive for us to start putting uh, data sets together at the global level to, to give some picture of spatial distribution of rangelands and the changes taking place. One of the things we have done as ILRI and with our partners is produce an atlas on rangelands. The atlas is a very good starting point for talking about drylands and the important role that drylands play in the world as, as an ecosystem that provides habitats for wildlife and for extensive livestock production. 
Our next steps going forward after the launch of the Global Rangelands Atlas is to a start raising awareness on rangelands and their productivity, their value, but also then see how we can work with other actors to really start identifying those areas where investment is needed, including restoration. I mention this particularly because this week, the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration will be launched. So for us, the Atlas is a very important starting point for discussions on this going forward.